Hi, I'm Ed Bastian, President of the Spiritual Paths Foundation, together with Tina Staley, Director of Pathfinders in Aspen. The Spiritual Paths Foundation helps people to understand the world's great spiritual traditions and to develop their own personal spiritual paths. We help people to become wise and compassionate participants in our pluralistic society and interdependent world. Last summer, we presented a program in Aspen at the Aspen Chapel and the Aspen Institute called Living Fully, Preparing for the End of Life and Beyond. Pathfinders has two divisions, Pathfinders for Cancer and Pathfinders for End of Life. At Aspen Valley Hospital, we work with cancer patients from the minute they're diagnosed all the way through the process. We have an end of life program where we help patients look at their end of life, whether they live two years or 20 years. We feel that by looking at the end of life and by facing our greatest fear, the patients are able to have more love, more empathy, and more appreciation for the moments in everyday life. The program that you're about to see is a sampling of individuals that are top in their field that come from a medical, a scientific, a philosophical, and a spiritual perspective. We find that everybody needs to find their own journey, and we hope to help you find that journey. Our program included Dr. Ira Bayak, one of America's foremost experts on palliative medicine. Marilyn Schlitz, the Vice President and Director for Research at the Institute for Noetic Sciences. William Cathers, a renowned seminar leader and speaker mm -hmm. connected with the Aspen Institute. Roshi Joan Halifax, a great Buddhist teacher and an expert on the end of life. Rabbi Zalman Schachter, who's renowned throughout the world for his teachings and his ecumenical points of view. Mother Tessa Balecki, the abbess of the Carmelite Monastery in Crestone, Colorado. Thank you for taking the time to view the program. We hope you find it as inspirational and meaningful as we have. I want to talk today uh, a bit about the personal experience of dying. The experience of dying is more than a set of medical problems to be confronted. In fact, the fundamental nature of dying is not medical, it's personal. It's experiential. I've very deliberately chosen this phrase, dying well. First, notice in that phrase, dying well, that well is an adverb that modifies the experience of dying. But it can also be an adjective that describes the person who is dying. Can people be well during the time that they're dying? And can people become more well during this time. I wrote the book Dying Well, which is a book of stories of people who have taught me that indeed human development can proceed during this time of life. And in fact, it is often spurred by the confrontation with death. There is opportunity during this time of life we call dying. At least opportunity to share sad news and feelings among family and friends, to complete affairs, business affairs and personal affairs, to complete relationships, to leave nothing left unsaid, to resolve previously strained relationships, perhaps between a father and son who haven't spoken in years, or previous spouses after a bitter divorce who haven't spoken in years, or a brother and sister long estranged, a chance to grieve together, acknowledging the loss to both uh, parties, a chance to explore those realms of meaning and purpose, those realms of connection to something larger than ourselves that are indeed part and parcel of the human experience. Years ago, I learned that before any significant relationship is complete, people have to have said at least four things before goodbye. Please forgive me, I forgive you, because if this is a significant relationship, or once was, there will always have been some history of tension. That's normal. Please forgive me, I forgive you, thank you, and I love you. 
Why wait till you or a loved one is dying to say the things that would be left unsaid? I mean, just think, 3,400 Americans die every month in car accidents. They didn't think they were dying when they left the home, their home that morning. And yet that day, all of their most significant relationships ended. And for anyone who loved them, an important relationship ended that day. I fully believe that how we care for people through the end of life is the central challenge of our generation and the criterion on which historians of the future will judge the moral worth of our generation. I believe that what we're doing here today, studying the full dimensions of hospice and palliative care, human caring through the end of life, represents a, a shift that needs to occur in our society and culture's approach to the end of life. From seeing dying solely as a time of misery and suffering, to understanding that dying is a part of full and even healthy living and a time of remarkable opportunity. We have an opportunity to contribute to a healthy reincorporation of the value of this time we call dying within the ongoing mystery of human life. That is, in fact, our great opportunity. With the beautiful communion between traditions and in this extraordinary place, the big sky overhead. Is there some way that you and I can remember that this very mind, this very heart, is as vast as this sky? Can we allow ourselves to just open to the boundlessness that is our inherent nature? Socrates never wrote anything down. Didn't bathe too often. <laughs> Didn't wear shoes asked a lot of questions, but there was one problem, one problem that was foremost on their minds. What makes a human life good? What makes it worth living? And what must we do, not just merely to live, but to live well, to live fully? That was the most important and difficult problem. And that live, and I read Aristotle and I started looking at this and I thought, Oh, there it is again. There's that denial of death again. I say the problem is to live well. Aristotle says to live and die well, 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 to live and die well. Cather says to live and highlight delete, to live, highlight, delete, <laughs> to live, highlight, delete. Right? Anybody else here with me on that? You know? <clears throat> and they just looked it in the eye and Socrates, their teacher, made them look it in the eye. What makes a human life good? What makes it worth living? And what must we do, not just merely to live, but to live well, to live fully? Behold, I have come to give you life, an abundant life, full life. Cicero said, all of philosophy is a preparation for death. All of philosophy is a preparation for death. And somehow, in that philosophical school, filled with math mathematicians, astronomers, political philosophers, they too equated that somehow that the better we face death, the better we live. The better we love, the more we give. Sanctus, 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 Dominus Deus Sabaoth, Plenis Uncelia Terra, Gloria Tua. This question of what happens when we die or what is the nature of consciousness is really sort of the mystery writ large. We can have dreams and visions, we can have plans for the future, but ultimately there is that final question mark at the end, what happens? And so this question, what happens when we die, what happens to consciousness? after we die, uh, provides a, a fundamental gateway into understanding the interface or the meeting place between the intimate, the ultimate, the effable, and the ineffable. And I wanted to start with just a couple of brief excerpts from some interviews I did with two members of indigenous communities, one from um, an Australian Aboriginal community and one from an Amazonian, uh, Ecuadorian Amazon community. We believe that nothing finishes. It's all a cycle. And so it's not about dying and therefore going and never returning or something ending. In fact, it's just a movement from one thing to the next. 
And then when I do leave my body, the point is, is that I can leave easily and that I choose to go and that I'm ready to go and that I finished all the business I have to do here in this life and that I have no one to make amends to. You know, that I finished, settled my relationships. In our world, we believe that when a person dies, they become another, as we would say, an animal. When someone has an experience with a spiritual force, he is transformed into arutom in order to transmit the force to another person, in order to help them. But generally speaking, we believe that when a person dies, they transform into animals such as the owl, the deer, or the pacifist bird. Now I want to turn to what happens when you really do move to that step of beginning to think about how science could say something to us about something that's profoundly cultural and spiritual. And the one that I want to play for you is from Bruce Grayson, who's a psychiatrist who works at the University of Virginia. One of the ways that I think you can differentiate the true spiritual experiences from the psychotic ones is in their effect on the person. And if you talk to near-death experiencers, they are freed by these experiences. They're seen as occasions for growth. I think that healing takes place when people discover what I want to call their non-local nature, the infinite quality of their consciousness, the capacity of their consciousness to exist infinitely in space and time. The realization that that part of who they are is eternal and immortal is not born, couldn't die if it tried, and does not sign off with the death of the brain and body. It seems to me that this is the realization that has the most uh, healing punch, if you will, for anyone. So there are various domains of evidence. Um, we can talk about the, the early days of psychical research. There are lab studies based on the notion of non-local consciousness, uh, which provides evidence for the idea that consciousness may be something more, as we heard today, than the brain itself, but something that transcends the brain. And then there are specific case studies uh, in terms of their evidential nature. And what I want to say is that none of these data points in and of themselves provide evidence conclusive of the survival of consciousness after bodily death. But what you find as you begin to amass the evidence is a compelling case for at least considering the possibility that science has something to say and that in fact there may be an ontological basis for beginning to understand some of these claims and practices from a Western scientific point of view. Creations are numberless. Creations are numberless. I vow to free them. I vow to free them. Delusions are inexhaustible. Delusions are inexhaustible. I vow to transform them. I vow to transform them. Reality is boundless. Reality is boundless. I vow to perceive it. I vow to perceive it. The awakened way is unsurpassable. The awakened way is unsurpassable. I vow to embody it. I was quite struck by the title, Living Fully, for many reasons, but two in particular. Because for me, the essence of Christianity is living fully. The other reason that I was struck by the title is because one of the most important teachings I received from my teacher is this. Choose death now. Let it come when and how it may, and draw from that confrontation consequences for life fully lived. If I were to define death, how would I define it very, very personally and existentially? And I would define it as letting go. And then we have to ask, well, what is it that we're letting go of? And also, what are we letting go for? We are letting go of life for the sake of more life. That is the mystery. And of course, this, the central um, mystery of Christianity is what we call the Paschal mystery, the Passover mystery, the Passover from death into life, which we see, of course, in our most um, profound image, which is the image of the crucifixion of Jesus. So when I look at a crucifix, 
I do not see death. I see the whole mystery, which is dying into life, letting go of life for the sake of more life. If we don't look at death, we don't know how to live. So it's extremely important to be very realistic about this. I ask the question, how can we face it? And I'd like just to read you this brief teaching from my teacher that I find so profound. He calls death the final breakthrough. Of course, it's really not final because there's nothing final. It goes on and on. And this is what he says. Uh, death usually involves a kind of violence, a wild human passion. Passion is a very big theme uh, in my community. A wild human passion if our proud self-imprisonment is going to be broken open. We prepare for the final act of death, which will usher us into eternal life, by striking blows now, mortal blows, to the false self, to the grasping and craving ego. Then I ask the question, do we need to be afraid of dying? And it's important to look at how Jesus approached his death, because we find both deep peace, and at the same time, he was afraid, and he was full of sorrow. So I look at that and I say, well, gosh, if he was afraid, there's nothing the matter with anyone else being afraid. Is it appropriate to long for death? If you read St. Teresa, you read St. John of the Cross, you find them saying things like, I die because I do not die. It's my experience that people do not experience resurrection enough because they don't let themselves die dead enough. You know, we begin to die, and it's so terrifying or so uncomfortable, so awful, that we pull back from the experience. And so we don't experience the resurrection. We don't experience all that life that's waiting for us because we don't have the courage to die. Grant us peace, Lord of peace, grant us peace. Salam alaikum, alaikum, sim shalom. Those of you who have um, issues around your mortality, around death, will you please stand up? <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. I'm standing, too. <laughs> I don't want to fool anybody. This is not easy work. Let's just close our eyes and work a little bit and explore for a minute how do you really want to die? What do you want to die of? Whom do you want there? When do you want to die? Where do you want to die? What is your best case scenario? Let's look at some of the values and behaviors that really support death. One is to develop both a positive and a realistic underlined image of dying death and life after death. Death, you are my friend. The value of living a very ethical and wholesome life. Think of others before yourself. 
Practice generosity. Give away the things that you like. You get to give it all away anyway. The moment of death, it's whew. And use hardship, suffering, to build patience and perspective. And see yourself as dead. And appreciate this moment. Contemplate the truth of your mortality and feel grateful. This is, no matter how impaired we are, this is already a miracle. I don't know who the poet is who said this, but someone gave this quote to me many years ago. Love and death are the great gifts that are given to us. Mostly they are passed on unopened. It is, to me, our, um, in a way, divine duty to open the gifts of love and of death. Like a torch burning, like a sea turning, like the patience of the soil, I have drawn my courage from a deeper knowledge through the long night's toil. I have seen the morning star upon the distant horizon. All the shadows of the dark cannot keep the sun from rising. Um, this summer I'll be 80. And there is a certain amount of truth that one speaks when one gets to close to end of life. And so the things I want to tell you about today are therefore like a witness to you. And uh, not just merely a talk, a presentation. There's this wonderful promise in the Psalms. The length of days I will satisfy you. So that when we get to that moment when we can look back at life and say, like the three bears, you know, not too long, not too short, just right. <laughs> and I'd like to have you come with me into that place where we can talk about that which is just right. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross describes one of her patients saying to her, Ich will mein Sterben erleben. I want to live through my dying. You know, I don't want to sleep through it. Not like um, Woody Allen said, I don't mind dying as long as I don't have to be there. <laughs> no. On the contrary, I want to be there. I know that the inevitable is about to come, and I don't want to fight it. I want to surrender that. I want to relax into it. And in this feeling of peaceful resignation, if you can get to that place, then you have a sense what a good death is about. That kind of resignation that says, Amen, to a big, big, long hymn of life. How do I know that I will survive that moment when my body ceases to be? Well, if I can tune in and, and raise my consciousness into that other body that is there, that is in another kind of place, even the energy body alone. All the people who have been doing Tai Chi and all these other things in which Chi has been aroused are already living more in that energy body. So you get the idea. We are that energy body and the disidentification with only the physical is very important for survival, for an afterlife. Sometimes I like to say consciousness is like tofu. It doesn't have taste. It depends what you marinate it in. <laughs> all, if you can imagine all the, all the senseless things that we have absorbed in our consciousness, you know, that sit on the hard drive of our life memory. Oi, how do you get rid of them? 
So we got to go to the mind laundry. <laughs> and that's what you call purgatory. <laughs> okay. You got to do some purging there, some cleaning up. You can't get the whipped cream on top of garbage. If we want to get to how beautiful heaven will be and we want to go to, to the good places, we are not going to be able to enjoy that if we haven't cleaned up all that stuff. I'm sharing this with you because I'm preparing myself too for that moment when that happens. Okay. And now we come to another teaching in our tradition that goes, calls Gilgul. Galgal is a wheel, Gilgul is reincarnation. And we have the teaching of reincarnation. And sometimes they say, it is because you uh, have some incomplete from the last life, you've got to come back and, and, and fix it up. This is the point in which we tell in our tradition that sometimes you have to come and see the results of what you left the last time around. And so reincarnation is sometimes not so such a good thing. Is that all that there is? Mystics tell us that there is a point when a soul is given the opportunity to merge with the infinite like a drop merges with the ocean. The language of the Zohar is le'ishtava bigufa de malka, to be absorbed in the very body of the king, of the sublime king. You can have that wonderful sense that would be a kind of cosmic orgasm in which one disappears in the other. And that would be a, a fantastic, tremendous thing. But you aren't around afterwards to, to gloat over it. <laughs> you know. Oh, you should see this world, a drop of dew, a bubble in a stream. Lightning in a summer cloud, a phantom and a dream. Oh, you should see this world, a drop of dew, a bubble in a stream. Lightning in a summer cloud, a phantom and a dream. Ah, Ya ve yishmerecha, ya er ya pana velecha, vichuneka, yisa ya pana velecha, viasem lecha shalom. Deep peace of the quiet earth to you. Deep peace of the running wave to you. Deep peace of the shining stars to you. Deep peace of the Prince of Peace to you.
you feel the vision? I feel the vision moving in me. I feel the vision.